question, of course, as there have been protests that have been happening for the last couple of days, ever since this actually shooting occurred, is what happened? Why did the officer uh, fire on a man, a young man, who was running away? Yeah, and we should, you know, remind people, too, that part of the reason that we know that he was running away is because a neighbor videotaped it uh, using her phone or something along those lines. But, in fact, the police officers did not, either they did not have cameras on them or they did not have the cameras on sure we'll get more information about um, what, what the DA will reveal right. at, least, at least a little bit more information. And, you know, she, she was heard on that video that you're talking about mm -hmm. saying, why are they shooting him? Why are they shooting him? Mm -hmm. Because he was running away. Mm -hmm. And I think for anybody who, you know, saw that video, they probably had the same question. Um, and it's been a couple of days. He was suspended. Uh, and you could hear there, I guess, I don't know if that was the spokesperson for the mayor or the spokesperson for the department, uh, the, the police department, saying that uh, basically lambasting the media yeah. for the coverage. Uh, but the coverage and the protests that have been happening for the last couple of days is, is most likely what got the attention of the district attorney. Yeah, so when the district attorney gets up there, we will head back there live to get that information. Uh, for now, though, good morning, everyone. I'm Anne-Marie Green. And I'm Vladimir Jutit. Thanks for joining us. We're going to begin this hour with this stunning defeat ahead of this year's midterm elections. This woman, 28-year-old Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, defeated 10-term Congressman Joe Crowley in New York, and her reaction, check it out. She's, she's like, what? <laughs> she had her mouth uh, covered. She couldn't believe it. She's a former Bernie Sanders organizer who just as recently as, no, I love that expression. Yeah. It, it, it is a wonderful story, no matter where you sit on the political divide, to see somebody who's so young, who's so interested in civics and making this country a better place, deciding to run for office at age 28. Back in November, she was a bartender. Mm -hmm. Well, last night she defeated the number four House Democrat, who was being considered as a, as a potential successor to minority leader Nancy Pelosi. Ocasio-Cortez spoke about winning her first ever race for office earlier on CBS This Morning. It was just so shocking. We had felt so great all day, but um, but to see what that feeling looked like and in numbers was really astonishing. Did you think you had a real shot at winning? I always felt like we had a shot and that we had a possibility to win, always, from day one. To help us break down this race, we are joined now by CBS News Chief Congressional Correspondent Nancy Cordes on Capitol Hill and CBSN political contributor Michael Graham. He is also politics editor for NHJournal.com and a Boston Herald columnist. Thanks for joining us, guys. Um, Happy to be here. Nancy, we're going to start with you. Uh, Crowley is the first congressional leader to fall in a party primary since former Republican House Majority Leader Eric Cantor lost to a Tea Party challenger in the 2014 midterm election. What went wrong here for Crowley? Well, uh, a couple of things. First of all, he's someone who hasn't faced a primary challenge since 2004, so he had probably gotten a little out of practice. And in a way, what happened to him is similar to what happened to Cantor in the sense that they're both leaders in their party, both very focused on what's going on here on Capitol Hill, uh, inter-party politics in his case, even more so because he was working to sort of cement support for uh, a possible run for Democratic leader at some point if Nancy Pelosi were to step away. Uh, and it may be that he simply took the eye off the ball in his home district, which encompasses parts of the Bronx and Queens. And in uh, his opponent, you had uh, a young, fresh face, someone who was very charismatic, burst onto the scene, who argued that she better represented the politics of the district and the makeup of the district. It's 70 percent minority in New York's 14th district and she made the case that her opponent who is twice her age who spends a lot more time in Washington uh, had 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 grown apart from the district and she better understood the people that she was seeking to represent and obviously uh, that resonated because this was not even a close call she really walked away with the win despite being outspent by something like 18 to 1. You mentioned that maybe he was out of practice in terms of running. Didn't he skip a debate altogether? He sent, sent a stand-in? 
in his place? He skipped a couple of debates, and, right. and that's right. He, he sent a surrogate to one of those debates, which really didn't uh, sit well. And in fact, the New York Times, which is the hometown paper, obviously, in, in, in his district, uh, actually uh, printed an editorial and said, hey, what are we chopped liver? You better worry, Congressman Crowley, that you're sending a message to your constituents here in New York that you don't have time for them because you're so busy with uh, politics down in Washington. So he did eventually um, show up for a debate with Ocasio-Cortez, uh, but by that point, it may have been too late. There are also signs that in the last few weeks of the race, he really woke up to the fact that um, not only was she getting a lot of attention in the national press, but that was she, she was really making inroads in the district, uh, but by that point, she had clearly cemented her support and felt comfortable enough that she even went to Texas over the final weekend of her campaign to protest uh, outside a detention facility uh, about families being separated. She wasn't even in New York pounding the pavement. She had a lot of supporters who were doing so, uh, but she was down in Texas tweeting from the border. Yeah, yeah, Nancy, you know, it's such a fascinating story. I was also surprised when she left the district to go down to the border to protest um, what was happening to separated families. And she had even called ICE a fascist organization. Now Crowley tried to sort of, you know, ride the coat. Back to Pittsburgh, where we're getting an update on the charges against the police officer accused of shooting and killing Antoine Rose. Or if you have the affidavit, I can just go through a recitation of some of the facts in the affidavit. Um, on June 19th of this year at 8.27 p.m., North Braddock Police Department was dispatched to the corner of Jones and Baldridge Streets. 911 indicates shots fired. The area is a concern to the police for previously other crimes there, including major crimes. Six communities that surround North Braddock Borough have a mutual aid agreement, which means that when something bad happens in that community, then the other six communities will support that police department. At 829, a witness tells North Braddock Police the shots are fired by a passenger in a car and fired at particular persons. 911, excuse me, 911 further describes the vehicle. Uh, the, the description of the vehicle is wrong. They describe it as a gold mercury. They also describe the direction the vehicle left the area. At 8.30, a victim, a white male, is identified 911 indicates gunshot wound to the abdomen. Ultimately, it's determined there's a grazing wound across the stomach that may be attributable to a bullet, may be attributable, attributable fragment from a building. Now, these matters, obviously, evidence continues to be developed. So as more evidence is developed, the description of the vehicle becomes uh, a light gold Chevy Cruze. The scene is secured by the Allegheny County Police shortly after the incident takes place. Uh, the Allegheny County Police, by the way, handled major crimes outside the city of Pittsburgh throughout Allegheny County. The uh, victim, the person that was grazed across the stomach, is treated and released. There is video surveillance at this intersection. Um, that video is attached as an exhibit to the criminal complaint, actually to the affidavit of the criminal complaint. What it shows is the cruise comes up Baldridge. There are three occupants in the car, driver, front seat passenger, uh, rear passenger side. The rear window comes down. A handgun goes out that window and opens fire on somebody at the corner. We believe we know who the target is, but the target is not identified in the, in the affidavit. The person who is shooting the weapon has a dark colored t-shirt on. The passenger in the front seat has a white t-shirt on. There is a man in North Braddock, who is across the street, he's not the intended victim. He returns fire 
when they process the scene, there are nine casings that go back to a 40 millimeter handgun. That's the handgun from the car. And there are four casings from the 45. Now from the 45, he strikes the crews three times. One goes in the rear window, one goes into the trunk to the right of the uh, license plate, and the third one goes into the driver's side, or the, excuse me, the passenger side door. There are multiple strikes on a wall, which is maybe about 10 to 15 feet from where the cruise comes up Baldridge, and that's where the intended target was. 13 minutes into processing this particular crime, the crimes that, that occurred in North Braddock, a call comes in and says shots are fired in East Pittsburgh. When detectives arrive, the scene is secure. The victim, Antoine Rose, had already been transported to McKeesport Hospital. It takes approximately five minutes to get from the site in North Braddock to the site where shots are fired in East Pittsburgh. The driver of the vehicle is in custody. The passenger with the dark t-shirts in the wind. They have several departments that are looking for him. That person is later identified as Zaywan, Zay I'm not pronouncing that properly, Hester. Z-A-I-J-U-A-N, Hester. He is the shooter in North Braddock. By all accounts, um, Mr. Rose never did anything in furtherance of any crimes in North Braddock. I know there's been some speculation in the meeting. Um, yesterday, or possibly the day before, Hester was apprehended by the sheriff's fugitive team. He was, he's currently lodged at Human Center. He'll be charged with various crimes under what's, what we refer to as Act 33 under Pennsylvania law. He will, he'll come into the, uh, the adult side of the courts. Now, this is significant to the car. Even though the car was struck three times, there's no blood evidence in the car. None of the passengers were struck in North Braddock. In East Pittsburgh, there are three spent casings that are recovered. They'll go back to a nine millimeter, nine millimeter weapon. That's the weapon of uh, Michael Rossfeld. There are two witnesses that are proximate to the location of the shooting. There is a video. Uh, from talking to the family this morning, we like to get the phone. We don't have the phone right now. We have the YouTube version of that video. Um, it's significant because we want to enhance it a little bit more. The driver is extracted from the vehicle. He's on the ground. As the officer begins to put cuffs on him, the two passengers get out of the car. According to the witnesses, Rose shows his hands, turns, and runs. He is not in possession of a weapon. Neither is the, uh, the other passenger in the, in the dark t-shirt. There's another witness with a video. He's using a camera, camera phone. The video doesn't add much to the, uh, to the evidence in the case. The car was processed, and they found two weapons in the vehicle. One is a nine millimeter weapon that was stolen. It's under the front seat towards the front of the car. The 40 caliber was also stolen. It goes back to three or four other crimes. It's under the front seat in, towards the rear. And it is the 90 caliber weapon that was used in connection with the shooting in North Braddock. The medical examiner did the autopsy and uh, submitted various reports Antoine Rose was hit three times. He was hit in the side of the face, in the cheek. The bullet exits through the nasal cavity. He's also hit in the right elbow from the rear. That's a through and through wound. 
He's hit in the mid-back, and that slug was recovered in his chest. That's the fatal shot. As I said before, that, not, that nine millimeter slug matches Rossfeld's service weapon. The at scene Facebook posting is consistent with the independent witnesses' statements. And as I said before, there's no weapon that would have created a, a risk to Officer Rossfeld. Based on that evidence, I find that Rossfeld's actions were intentional, and they certainly brought about the result that he was, look, he was looking to accomplish. He was not acting to prevent death or serious bodily injury. It's my position that he is not entitled to a justification charge to a jury as a defense, inasmuch as under Pennsylvania law, if you are effectuating an arrest, you have to show the person to be arrested has committed a forcible felony. As I said already, Antoine Rose didn't do anything in North Braddock other than be in that vehicle. And you have to possess a weapon. Neither of those young men were in possession of a weapon. Or you have to otherwise indicate that somebody is in a position to take human life, and that is not the case here. Now these are based upon jury instructions in a superior court case out of Philadelphia. Uh, an appeal was taken to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, which was denied. Now this is the third time that we've had this factual scenario during my tenure. The first two date to the beginning, the beginning of my tenure. Um, you're aware that I directed that uh, one count of criminal homicide be filed in connection with this case as it was in the prior two, given the same scenarios. Uh, I credit our chiefs of police and the ladies and gentlemen of law enforcement for getting it. So for instance, last year alone, we had 1.2 million, in excess of 1.2 million calls to law enforcement. And we looked into two matters which involved police use of deadly force. That's still too, too many, but just to give you the numbers. With that being said, I'll take questions. <clears throat> Offer to recuse yourself based on a conflict of interest with the family this morning? No. What's my con? Tell us about the driver of the vehicle. Pardon me? Tell us about the driver of the vehicle. Dri as best we can tell, he's a, uh, like a, a Uber driver, Jitney. Um, he's very forthcoming. Of course, he's looking at, you know, driving somebody to the scene of a, a shooting has criminal implications. So he was, he was very forthcoming with the county police. Can you say more about uh, the exact charges and when we'll learn them? Uh, I know there's a series of possibilities. Is that something that's going to be determined by a jury? Will the charges be narrowed? And what are the potential penalties attached? The charges against the officer? Yes. Uh, one kind of criminal homicide. The evidence supports third degree murder. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Manslaughter, voluntary manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter. But we think we should have the right to argue uh, murder in the first degree. And what would be the penalty For first degree murder? That's life. Third degree is 20 to 40 years. Manslaughter is three and a half to seven. Steve, Steve can you break down why you think the third degree murder It's an intentional act, and it's done recklessly. And there is no justification for it. Officer Rosefeld, Officer Rosefeld in the affidavit says that he believed that uh, Antoine Rose was in the Uh, his, we took a statement from Rossfeld. He's on audio and video. He indicates that at no time was there a weapon in play. DA. Yes, sir. Did you feel pressure to charge in this case? No, sir. I've been in, I've been doing this for a long time. The community protests, the outrage from the family. You felt no pressure at all to charge. No, I did not. As I said, this is the third time we've had this this particular fact scenario during my tenure. Charged the first two times. We're charging this time. How would you describe the actions of Officer Rossfeld that night? I think I just did. Steve, did Antoine Rose fire a gun at all that night? Pardon me? Do you believe Antoine Rose fired a gun at all that night? No, he did not. 
Are you, are you aware of any, any history of this sort of incident uh, in Officer Rothfeld's past? And what, if anything, can you share or have you learned about the circumstances of his departure from his previous job at the University of Pittsburgh or any other? The county police has all his personnel files, and I don't want to get into that today, but we're aware of his background. The criminal complaint against the officer uh, refers to his initial reference to seeing something in a hand, and then he makes a different statement later. The uh, complaint describes that as inconsistency. Can you explain the differences between what he said and what you used in the inconsistency? Well, he specific, specifically says that he didn't see a weapon. It said, That's significant. In the, in the statement, though, he said that he believed, believed that he saw a dark object. Yeah, that's, that, that's inconsistent with the witness statements. It's inconsistent with the YouTube video. Does he need to see a gun or just something he believes is a The jury instruction says there has to be a deadly weapon. Did Officer Rossell express that he was afraid at the time of the shooting? And if so, why didn't he fire the pressure? I don't know that. I know he was remorseful. Yeah, one involved the city of Pittsburgh police officer on Second Avenue, and one involved the housing authority police officer in the Armstrong tunnels. Both times, all three times, somebody was shot in the back, and they were not a threat to the to the police officer who was engaged in whatever aspect of uh, their job. Was Officer Russell uh, on a taser as well? Could he have used a taser? In I can only tell you that Antoine was about 15 yards before he collapsed. So he starts on the passenger side of a relatively small vehicle, but I doubt that a taser could have been used. Steve, can you talk about the previous shooting in North Braddock and what impact that would have had on shooting in East Pittsburgh on Officer Roscoe when he does stop a car involved in it? He suspects it was involved in that felony shooting just 13 minutes earlier. Does he go in with apprehension then? I mean, can you address that? Well, I think you got to go. The whole situation. Sure. I mean, did that affect the decision to charge him or not? I think you got to go in with apprehension. Yeah. But unless you see a genuine threat, then it's inappropriate to take, in fact, criminal to take somebody's life. And that's the, that's the reason you brought the charges? Then? Primarily, yes. Was the foot chase an option? Did he say, or was there any evidence that he had a foot chase? Well, their training, their training says you disable the vehicle first, which he did. Take the driver out, keys out, show me your hands, that type of thing. Um, you got three guys in the car. You wait for backup. So he's taking three guys out of the car before backup gets there. Can you talk about the inconsistencies that are noted at the end of the complaint in Roscoe's telling of the version of events? I'm sorry, I don't follow you. At the end of the criminal complaint, the detectives know that he told two different versions of events. He played inconsistencies. Can you talk any more about that or address that? Actually, I believe it's three. The object, the lack of a gun, then he goes back to an object in his hand. That's a jury question. Yes. DA, what's your message to Antoine's family? We had a, we had a very nice conversation. They're, they're very decent people. Obviously, they're, they're very distraught about the loss of their son, who by all indications is, is a good kid. Um, I'm going to keep that private between us, but uh, it, was, it, it was a good conversation. And to the community? You, you can't take somebody's life under these circumstances. Steve, you said previously that Antoine Rose had an empty clip in his pocket. Yes. Do you know the, the genesis of that or where that came from? Yeah, we're speculating. The gun was stolen. He, the clip is what the original clip was for the 9 millimeter. They changed that out for an extended clip. So instead of 9 shots, you have 17. They changed it out to the other gun? No. There's a longer clip for the 9 millimeter. So instead of nine shots, I think it's 17. So are you indicating that Hester fired the shots from that gun and then switched clips? No, there's two, <clears throat> there's two guns in the car. There's a 40 and a nine. Okay. Both guns are stolen. The nine's under the front seat. The nine is never discharged. The 40 is discharged, and it's from the rear seat. And you guys are going to get the video feeds from bo both North Braddock, and you've, you've probably already seen the, the, the feeds on YouTube. But uh, clearly, the person whose arm is out the window with gun extended has a black T-shirt on. 
And other, there's other evidence, too, that indicates that Hester's the shooter. So where did this empty clip It was already in the, it was in the weapon. In the weapon. Yes. You take, yeah. You take the clip out because it's only nine shots. You take an extended clip and you put it in at 17. It's a trend. So it was never discharged. The nine millimeter was never discharged. Never discharged. That's correct. Did you say that Officer Boss would be at any point say that he feared his life was in danger? I don't know if he said that in his interview or not. And also, did you, you stated that he took the people out of the car, that the procedure is to stop the safety vehicle. But you seem to indicate that he could have just waited for backup rather than trying to do the things he did. Norm You're saying he went against uh, protocol or against training? Normally you wait for backup, yes, when you have multiple persons in the vehicle. You said that uh, you could have, uh, you have evidence charging at least third degree murder and then voluntary involuntary manslaughter, but you made a decision to go with uh, first degree murder. Was that ultimately your decision? Can you talk about uh, the decision to go with that most serious charge? Yeah, usually we charge criminal homicide, just one count generally. That goes back to when we had a coroner instead of a medical examiner, because we were getting pretty bad decisions out of the coroner's office. So to clarify, you charge the general charge of homicide, which has, as Mike explained to the reader, the range of possibilities yes. from first to third. Yes. To clarify your remarks earlier, in which you said clearly that there's evidence for a third. Are you saying that that's what you would pursue with trial? Are you saying the evidence at the minimum shows that, but you will prosecute seeking uh, uh, first degree? We're going to, right now, we would ask a jury to consider all degrees of homicide. So, Which narrowing it will be in the hands of the jury, not, you'll leave that to the jury should it come to trial. Right. And that's why we do that, because the coroner was making the determination and not a juror. Jury. You did say that you believe you have the right to argue for first degree. Yes, ma'am. Did your office argue against Officer Ross that will be released on bond? We objected to it, yes. Well, you have an officer in the, in the county jail otherwise. I'm not sure safety considerations, security considerations, that type of thing. We objected, and we've taken that matter under advisement. I haven't made a decision what I want to do yet. We talk about lessons learned. We talk about training. Does there need to be more training? Is there? Do you have any thoughts on, on what needs to happen in the block? Yeah. We have in Allegheny County. We have the Allegheny County Chiefs of Police Association, which is a really progressive, professional group of uh, uh, law enforcement members. Um, those guys come out with model policies. They they can't obligate individual police departments to follow those policies. So, in this case. Yeah, I am concerned of the lack of policies and procedures in East Pittsburgh. And East Pittsburgh, by the way, is not the city of Pittsburgh. It's a separate municipality towards the uh, eastern part of the county. Um, we have 118 police departments, some, some of which are run very well, some of which we have to keep an eye on all the time. But that's a creature of the legislature. If the legislature wants to do something about it, we're all here today. Let's tell them to do it. Steve, was there gunshot residue found on Hester's hands, and was there gunshot residue found on Rose's hands? Tests are pending. You don't know? At this point, we do not know. Probably there is not going to be residue because the gun was far enough out the window that it wouldn't have blown back. Uh, on Hester? On Hester. But clearly, Hester's the shooter. Did you test Rose, too? Yes. Those are pending. Those are pending. So you don't back into the law. Can you talk about the idea of an officer fleeing felon and whether or not that can be justification for an officer shooting somebody who may have just previously been involved in a potentially serious felony. Yeah, under, under, under the arrest scenario, generally speaking, an officer has to be in fear of, of death or serious bodily injury. Then you can return that threat with, the, with, with appropriate force. If you're trying to effectuate an arrest, then what you have to show is several things. You have to show that there was a forcible felony, okay, shooting at somebody in North Braddock could be considered a forcible felony, but it was committed by Rose. It was not committed, excuse me, it was committed by Hester, not by, not by Antoine. You also, but you also have to show that a weapon's involved or that you are otherwise in serious, you know, there's the possibility of serious bodily injury. Those elements clearly are not there. Steve, talking about the, the gun, and you said Antoine Rose did not fire a gun, but him being in the car at that drive-by shooting, does that make him a party to the crime? No. But the driver is a party to the crime. The driver could, could be. How, what is the difference there? Well, we need him as a witness. Uh, 
Do you know how Pat Antoine and Rose happened to be in that car or what led up to his decision to be involved in this? Was he we have, a, we have an idea of motive, but I can't comment on motive, yes. Do you have any concerns, or can you talk about any concerns you have about East Pittsburgh um, policy and procedures or lack of East Pittsburgh police? Yeah, I'm going to take that up with the U.S. Attorney. And you know for a fact that Antoine Rose didn't know uh, this Hester, say Ron Hester, they were acquaintances. Are you clear on that? Yes, they knew each other. Steve, regarding those policies, are you saying that they did not have uh, well-defined policies about how to conduct that traffic stop? In, in response to questions by the major crime investigators, when they first came on scene in East Pittsburgh, they said, well, how do you handle these situations? What's your policy? And they said, we don't have policies. That's, that's a very dangerous situation. Why was that so They don't have policy for what? East Pittsburgh police? For anything, as far as we know. Is the U.S. Attorney's Office pursuing a civil rights case against Rossfeld in any way? We've been in touch with the FBI, yes. Rossfeld gets training. Uh, primarily with the University of Pittsburgh. He's 10 years with those guys. This isn't like his first stop. Can you talk some more about the danger of not having a policy for the procedures? Somebody's dead. Can there be any more dangerous situation? Defendant in Pittsburgh? Responsible in any way? I'm sorry? Does that make East Pittsburgh responsible in any way? <laughs> Criminally? No. Civilly? They're going to they get a lot of answering to do. On the matter of not challenging what uh, you believe to be improper police on the bond, uh, we objected to it. Again? We objected to the, the bond that was issued. But going forward, are you likely or do you expect within the next week or so to bring that matter before uh, an Allegheny County uh, shot? Yeah, the way, the way bond works in Allegheny County is initially, it's, it's a judicial function. So initially what you do is if you, if you hit the county jail, then you go in front of a, an arraigning magistrate. The Intake people are there, the bail agency's there, and the public defender's office is there. We don't participate in those types of matters. Um, by constitution, if you charge generally homicide, then you shouldn't be able to be bailed. And the magistrate set the bail at $250,000 unsecured. So that's a matter that I'll, I'll talk to Judge Manning, because he hears, he hears appeals from bond issues. So, uh, do you, can you say, it, just to clarify, do you intend well, I'll talk to my team and see if that affects how we're going to try the case the and make a decision. The processing here took about an hour. Generally, it takes you know, eight to ten hours. Was there special treatment at the, at the jail? No, this is being handled just like any other homicide. Why was Hester firing out of the back of the car? We, ha we have an idea of that, but it deals with motive, and I can't comment. I'm not permitted to comment under the rules of professional conduct. Can you talk about the protests at all? What's your reaction to what's been happening here in your county? I'm taking care of business. <laughs> we, I mean, we, whether, you're, whether you feel pressured. I mean, just in general, the blocking of the streets, the protests happening. Uh, I don't know that I really do have an opinion. I mean, I mean, the people own the criminal justice system, and if they've got issues with it, I think they have the right to express that. Steve, do you believe this could be a test case uh, having a blanket uh, ruling that an officer did not shoot a police suspect? It's not a blanket ruling. The, uh, it, as I said before, the Superior Court addressed this in the mid-90s in terms of the jury instruction. That was appealed to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, which was denied. It was heard on a collateral appeal in the federal courts in Philadelphia who upheld the Superior Court's determination. Do you believe that should be the standard? It is the standard. I mean, the standard of, a, of an officer not, if not being proper procedure in any event, to shoot a I'm not saying that. I'm saying that I've just told you the circumstances under which it is appropriate to use deadly force if you're effectuating an arrest. Steve, do you think uh, Antoine Rose was just in the wrong place at the wrong time? Just a matter of circumstances? I really can't. I can't speak to that. I mean, he's in a car, but he didn't do anything in furtherance of... If you want to call it a conspiracy, he didn't do, do anything in furtherance of that. Given the clip in his pocket that he was shooting the front seat passenger and the weapon was under the seat or on the front seat, do you in 
further using possession of a stolen weapon based on, on that? You can infer that, yes. There's, a, there's other evidence, but that's really of no moment when we're talking about a homicide. So it's not relevant to uh, uh, the officer's actions or his status, uh, Rose's own uh, status in that instance? The possession of an empty clip? No. It doesn't have anything to do with the thought, thought processes. We also talked about the complicated history with the University of Pittsburgh. Can you talk about how he got hired by the Eastern Police Department? I'm not going to get into personnel issues. I mean, that may be relevant at the time of trial. Again, I'm, I'm talking to you guys from the substance of an affidavit that supports a criminal complaint, so that I'm limited to discussing the issues that are in the affidavit. Rose's attorney has said that there are some, some previous instances where Ross felt um, threatened by the police. Do you think that We have his entire personnel file. Um, chief Loftus, who formerly, who's the, the chief of the Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh Police, was formerly the chief of Miami Metro. So he, he knows what he's doing. And we talked to him at length. Are you going to release the personnel file? Pardon me? Are you going to release the personnel file? It's not part of the prosecution. Well, without getting into specifics again, I mean, is this what, what you saw? Uh, about his prior uh, behavior as an officer. Did that give you concern? Yes. He made false statements against suspects in uh, the garage door. I'm not going to get into details. Um, can you talk about the uh, eyewitness accounts of um, him showing his hands as he ran away in one row? Um... Yeah, we have a witness specifically who says his hands go up and he turns immediately and runs. There's, and both witnesses that are right there. Your cars parked, say it's parked in front of me. The next house over, and the next house, the next house over. They're, they're witnesses. And this, is, and this is after he exits the car. Yes, exits, turns, books. <clears throat> Here that he was showing his hands in an effort to show the officer he was unarmed. That's what the witnesses say. That's what the video from YouTube indicates. Now we'd like to enhance that, but um, we're not at that point yet. I want to say that was three days ago. How long was that interview with her conducted? County Police. Or was it, was it at Tomassi's? <laughs> Penn Hills Police Department. It's on audio and video. How many hours was he? I don't know that. I can, I can get that for you. And you can you just tell us, I, I, you might have touched on this, but what did you have to weigh when you reviewed this case and this investigation? You know, what is the bigger picture for you? Well, it's the same thing that I indicated earlier when I first came into office. You, taking human life is the most important back if they are not a threat to you. How long do you have to make that decision? How many seconds was it from the time you pulled the vehicle over to a shot and from I don't know exactly the number of seconds, but it was very quickly. Can you go back to the police training? Uh, yes, sir. Across, across the board uh, around Allegheny County officers, you usually only have... One time a year, they do shoot, don't shoot training. Do you think that it should be increased? Well, most of the guys that are in these small towns, they train a minimum standard. It's called Act 120. Um, yeah, you have to you have to have a refresher every year. You have to discharge, you know, fire a weapon. Um, our our community. Are you from Allegheny County? Yes. Okay. So in the North Hills, you face a different type of threat and a different type of crime than you do in the Mon Valley or that you may do in the periphery of the city of Pittsburgh. So yeah, the guys who handle major crimes on a regular basis, they usually use the county police, but uh, if, you, if you're going to get in a fire, a firefight, you know, you, you got to be trained properly. So it's kind of a constant battle, but as I said before, the chiefs of police in our county, they're very progressive and, and uh, um, I think they're, they're a great agency. Uh, in terms of video of this, you had uh, indicated uh, a municipal video, uh, a bus video. Can you recount, is there a video that is yet in hand, in some authorities hand, but yet to be viewed? Uh, what video will you be able to release after this news conference today, and what do you anticipate would actually be shown at the preliminary hearing? At that intersection in North Braddock, there are actually three cameras. And what we did is we had the techs at uh, the county police 
put them together. So you can see the car come up Baldridge, turn, start, begin to turn left onto Jones, even before they start to make the turn. The gun goes, hand goes out, gun, go, you know, gun goes out the window, shots are discharged. You can, you can have that, that's an exhibit. You can have, just ask Mike, it's been redacted. The unredacted version will go into evidence at the preliminary hearing or whenever the, whenever the courts first convene on this matter. Do you know, uh, during the Act 120 training, at least in Allegheny County, uh, are officers put through a scenario in the fast machine of a clean felon? Do you know if that's one of the scenarios or sims in the fast? I believe it is. Okay. I believe it is. Do you anticipate, just to clarify, the fire Oh, I'm sorry. You asked me about the uh, well, bus bus video. We just received video from that particular bus. A bus goes through that intersection just before shots are fired. Our buses normally have six cameras, so we haven't we haven't had a chance to look at that yet. But it's it, it could it could help us. But we know we know who the as I said several times we know who the shooter from the car is. We know who the the guy is that returned fire on the street. We're looking for him now too. At the preliminary hearing, do you, do you say yet? That No, the detective would testify as to what he said in the interview. Hey guys, we're going to wrap this up. See, One more question. Is Hester cooperating in the investigation into Officer Russell? No, not at this point. All right, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate it. Thank you. You know it was to Hester, not to Russell. All right, you've been listening to a press conference there by the Allegheny County District Attorney. He addressed the homicide charges filed against an officer, uh, Michael Rosfeld. He is now accused of shooting and killing Antoine Rose, Officer Rosfell shot Rose, a black teenager, three times. The DA revealed some new details about the case, saying he believes Rose did not commit any crimes during the incident. He also said the officer's actions were intentional and there was no justification for it. The shooting unleashed days of protest in Pittsburgh. And we're going to be following this case all along. We got a little, a, a few more sort of details about uh, where the bullets hit uh, Antoine. He was shot in the side of the face. He was shot in the right elbow from behind. But the the shot that killed him was a shot in his, to his mid-back that yeah. came from behind. So further proof that he was actually running away. And what the district attorney said was, yes, the officer was investigating the report of a drive-by shooting. All indications are that the drive-by shooting came from this vehicle. But the information that the officer had was that somebody in the back seat shot, and that person was wearing a dark-colored T-shirt. Antoine was in the front seat. He was wearing a white T-shirt. He never displayed a weapon in any way. And for that reason, the district attorney felt that he, the, the officer did not have cause for the deadly force that he uh, took. In fact, he said, and this is a quote, you do not shoot someone in the back if they are not a threat to you. And I think that's the way he's proceeding, which is, as you point out, Emory, he said very clearly that he believes that this officer shot intentionally. There were some questions about uh, the procedures that are in place at this particular police department when it comes to somebody the, uh, who may have been accused or there's a witness who said this person did something and if they're running away and they don't have a weapon what the police procedures are um, and as long as the officer doesn't feel it's a threat to public safety you shouldn't be shooting at right. somebody in a neighborhood. That being said, the charges, it's not first degree murder, it's a uh, third degree. It, right, third degree, uh, it's a uh, voluntary and involuntary manslaughter. And homicide. But still, you know, uh, comes with a hefty um, a hefty punishment should he be convicted. Although he did say that he's going to try for murder one. Uh, that carries a life sentence. I think uh, I heard him say a third degree um, is a 20 to 40 year mm -hmm. sentence. Uh, but so that's where we are right now with this. And you can certainly bet that the family of Antoine Rose is at least, even though they're suffering throughout this period since they've lost their, their son, their family brother, member, uh, that they will be relieved to hear that the attorney general is going to uh, charge uh, Officer Rosfeld. On the other hand, as we've seen time and time again, when it gets down to a jury, it becomes very diffi difficult uh, for um, 
district attorneys, prosecutors, to prove what he said, which is that Officer Rosfeld intended the intent that was behind mm -hmm. his actions. Um, we've seen that in the Freddie Gray case. We've seen that in the Michael Brown case. Uh, and so we'll have to see how this all plays out in East Pittsburgh. We have a reporter there, Nikki Batiste. She's uh, covering the story for us. We'll check back in with her a little later. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. Meanwhile, we are following new developments on the Trump administration's zero tolerance immigration policy. A federal judge in California has ordered authorities to reunite immigrant families separated at the border. Families must be reunited within 30 days. The Department of Health and Human Services says more than 2,000 children remain separated. David Begnos at the border in McAllen, Texas with the latest. It's a preliminary injunction issued in the Southern District of California by U.S. District Judge Dana Sabra, which says the government is blocked from carrying out any future family separations. The order also says parents cannot be deported before being reunited with their children. Under the present system, Judge Sabra writes, migrant children are not being accounted for with the same efficiency and accuracy as property. Certainly, that cannot satisfy the requirements of due process. We do not want any children separated from their parents any longer than absolutely necessary under the law. Hours before the judge's order, President Trump's Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, told Congress that the government would not return children to parents who are being held in custody. If the parent remains in detention, unfortunately, under rules that are set by Congress and the courts, they can't be reunified. Azar is referring to the Flores Agreement. That says that immigrant children cannot be held in detention for more than 20 days. Now, HHS says there are currently 2,047 children still separated from their parents. That's just six less than the number the government gave us last week. Last week, we had about 3,100 apprehensions. We had been consistently over 4,200 apprehensions a week. We went to see Border Patrol Chief Manuel Padilla, who runs the busiest sector on the border. He says last week, as the national debate was raging over separating families, the number of apprehensions dropped. Preliminarily, what does that say to you? That it works. Hmm. Having a consequence to illegal entry works. CBS News correspondent David Begno is with us now from the border in Mission, Texas. So I know it's early, David, but do we have any idea how this ruling from this California judge will impact the conditions where you are? 
No, because we haven't heard any comment from the White House yet or the Department of Health and Human Services. Remember some context here. The government has said before we just start reunifying families, we need to first make sure that the adult who crossed the border with the child is actually related because there are cases where smugglers will bring an individual who poses as a parent. Turns out they're not related. And so the government's saying we want to use DNA testing and other testing to make sure that these people are related and then we'll reunite them. All right, so that's the government side. The other side is what's taking so long, right? You separated them. You did that pretty quickly. Why can't you reunite them? So uh, how the decision is going to be implemented, how it's going to affect the situation, we don't know. We're waiting for Washington to weigh in. So David, can you take us through the situation at the border right now where you are? What's the scene like today? It's really quiet. We're in an active spot. That's Mexico right over my shoulder. Uh, it's another day um, where you have Border Patrol in this active area where people are swimming across the Rio Grande, uh, detaining people. They detain dozens, hundreds. Uh, but as you saw in the piece a short time ago, the man who runs this area, the busiest sector along the southern border, says that at the point everyone was sort of outraged over the separation of families and it was happening, it looks like the numbers dropped almost by a thousand, which is pretty significant according to the Border Patrol chief too early to say for sure that the separating of families worked, but it's a notable difference, down about a thousand. That's when the separations were happening. So we'll have to see, but it's just a, another normal day on the border. David, we saw in your piece that you spoke to Manuel uh, Padilla. He's the chief border patrol for the Rio Grande sector. Um, he's been really open with the media yeah. and available, and he has previously mm -hmm. defended the administration's policy of separating uh, parents from their children. So what is he saying now? Well, he says that. I mean, in the piece, he said it appears to have worked. Preliminarily speaking, the separation of families worked. Now, the people who are critics of the policy say even if it did work as a deterrent, it was immoral. That's what critics say. The Pope said that. Now, in the process, what happens now, right? So I was asking Chief Padilla, so if you're no longer, no longer going to separate families, what are you going to do? And he said, well, we can only keep them in our custody for 72 hours. So he said, we got to figure out at some point, we're not referring adults for prosecution if they came across the border with a child, but we still want to prosecute them. So I said, well, how do you have your cake and eat it too, right? If you can't separate families, but you still want to prosecute them, what do you do? I said, what about bringing immigration judges into the facility? And he said, well, that's actually something we're looking at right now, because the separation happened when they were doing them as the adult went to see a judge that's when they were separated from the child if you bring the judge in the facility you can take care of it there because in most cases especially with first-time offenders they usually take them in in groups 15 20 at a time they ask them if they want to plead guilty the person says yes the judge gives them credit for time served in most cases and that's it Credit for time served, pay a fine, you're out. So it's pretty quick, right? So if you can actually get them through the legal process, enter a plea, you can take both the parent and the child and then deport them. That's one thing that they're looking at right now. All right, David Begno for us on the border there in Mission. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. You bet. In Money Watch today, beer is being rationed in Europe due to a shortage of carbon dioxide.